If you have seen this season's big space opera, The Empire Strikes Back, then you've seen this intergalactic dreadnought. You probably have asked yourself, how in the world did they do that? The complicated mixture of sophisticated technology, space-age machinery, and starry-eyed fantasy in today's science fiction films just may serve as inspiration for a coming generation of scientists. Hey, right behind you. This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Ah, that's brilliant. The timing of those two snow speeders was amazing. It was so amazing that they had to travel through time to get to Fortress Inquisitorius and they got all the way to the flight hangar before anyone even noticed them. Apparently the Empire doesn't even have radar. What an asshole. I mean, Han had way more trouble getting past the Empire defenses. I don't know. Fly casual. So did the Rogue One crew. But nothing like that here at Fortress Inquisitorious. Great name. These two losers just fly straight up and start blasting. Here's a fun fact. You know why you don't see many spongy looking Air Force pilots? It's a physically demanding job. You have to be super fit. But we can't worry about that. We have egomaniacs that are too weak willed to stop shoving pies in their mouths who want to see themselves on screen. And they want to see themselves doing the most physically demanding jobs. Now that does put the fantasy into this show. Right behind you. coming in more and more for Kentucky Fried Chicken. The AT-AT attack on Hoth is arguably the most famous battle scene in Star Wars, painstakingly put together by a group of guys that were inventing a new type of cinema. Visually amazing, and with a book ended by Vader's I Am Your Father reveal, has a lot to do with many people citing Empire Strikes Back as their favourite Star Wars movie. It's a pity that famous walker scene has already been devalued when the creators of Rogue One decided to have a Star Destroyer just fly suborbital and park right next to a town. Really makes Vader look like a bad leader. Instead of sending in those slow AT-ATs, he could have just parked a Star Destroyer on the Rebels. But better still, after Disney's Lucasfilm decided that Star Destroyers could just fly down to a planet to fix any problem, the Lucasfilm Brain Trust then decided to let Mr. Potato Head here show that not only were walkers still a thing, they were now new and improved, as they were much, much bigger. Because that's how great writers evolve an idea. They just make it bigger. In what situation besides the one time every Star Destroyer was wiped out by an angry fashionista, what other situation would call for a slow walking tank ahead of a fucking Star Destroyer just flying down and blasting everything to bits? But it wasn't just the AT-ATs that made that scene special. It was also the awesome snow speeders. All right, boys, keep tight now. And in line with the usual amount of respect given to everything the old guard did, the famous and loved snow speeders are reduced to... We could take those speeders. You have some T-47s. Those speeders are for hauling sewage. Yes, those speeders are for hauling sewage. Besides the fact that I don't even know why they would need to haul sewage in space. Well, if they follow standard Imperial procedure, they'll dump their garbage before they go to light speed, and then we just float away. Where from the sky comes a bunch of... Feces. Lucasfilm's contribution to the history of these iconic ships is that they are used by our heroes to move human shit. <laughs> Very subtle. I don't know who Lucasfilm hates more, George or his old characters. And the decision to have these ships in this show is even more proof that modern Lucasfilm has no understanding of the thought process behind the original trilogy. The thought process behind the vehicle designs. You know, just one of those small things that made Star Wars iconic. The ship designs in the original trilogy were meant to have a very modern yet lived in design that as George put it, wouldn't stand out. Very much like the car designs becoming popular in the late 70s and through the 80s. Sharper lines and futuristic cabins with flat practical layouts. Then with the prequels being set 20 to 30 years before the original trilogy, George again took inspiration from his love of cars and looked at the car designs happening 20 to 30 years before the 70s, 80s future. The smoother, shinier ships all took their inspiration from the colourful chrome featuring more shapely cars from the 50s. The work of art ships from the prequels 
evolved into a more mass-produced flat panel design that robots could put together, just like cars did from the 50s to the 70s. The decision from George to change the ship design so much when doing the prequels was creative brilliance that threw a lot of people off that couldn't understand how the ship designs in the prequels looked more advanced than the flat panel ships in the original trilogy, when in reality this design evolution happens all the time. The 60s were a time of radical beautiful design, where the 80s were a design wasteland where plastic took over and everything could be mass produced. So how does our old Herbert Hot Rodder from the 50s know of the future designed 80s DeLorean? He mentions the T-47s as if they were a common ship before he went into hiding. So, back in the prequel era, then these guys talk about the T-47s hauling human shit as if they're already old pieces of junk that have passed their prime. That would be like watching the F-14s in the original Top Gun of the 80s turn up in Apocalypse Now's Vietnam. And in Apocalypse Now, they talk about the F-14s being used in the Korean War. And so now in Vietnam, they're only good for transporting human shit. All right, give it to me, I'll take it. <laughs> Look at this. Ever since the XP-38 came out, they just aren't in demand. And surprisingly, one of the Disney films did try and get this right. The scapegoat film that took all the blame changed the course of Lucasfilm production, but is aging much better than the sequels. Solo, a Star Wars story, actually tried to get this right. That a Star Wars story idea really didn't last that long. Yes, Solo, a Star Wars story is the only production to have some idea of what era it's meant to be set in. Your empire needs you, troopers forward! where Lucasfilm now just copy everything from the original trilogy and don't even attempt to bring in design elements that would show the past designs of the prequels and hint at the future designs of the original trilogy, Solo at least attempted to bring in design elements that looked like they could be from a time between the ornate prequels and the hard-edged original films. They showed the modern Star Destroyers being built. And fuck me, they actually dropped the recurring joke of the Millennium Falcon being a pile of junk. The most loved spaceship in movie history was brand new with a super proud owner. We'll just have to ignore that when Revenge of the Sith came out, the digital department decided to insert the Millennium Falcon as a little Easter egg. The solo creators actually understood the wild concept that you didn't have to make every ship a pile of junk. And depending on which era your story is set in, the ships could actually be new. Or maybe, and try and stay with me, maybe they don't even exist yet. Right you. Crazy idea for Lucasfilm to grasp, seeing as all they have is referencing the old movies. I am a princess of Alderaan. <laughs> designs always evolve over time, but not in this show. This show has jumped from Chevy's to the Starion in all its design choices. Everything looks exactly like we're already in the New Hope era. The buildings, the stormtroopers, and the ships. I mean, this show is so void of creativity that they fucking have 10 year old Luke wearing the same clothes he's wearing in a New Hope. So it's not like they're going to design a ship that sits between the ETA-2 Actus class Interceptor and the New Hope era TIE Fighter. The mental giants making Star Wars now think that a big switch was flicked at the end of Revenge of the Sith and everything went from looking like the prequels to looking like a New Hope overnight and then those designs were locked in forever. That's why Obi-Wan looks like it's set at the same time as Mando and we have fucking TIE Fighters and X-Wings in The Rise of Skywalker and I can already hear those soft little hands of the Disney defenders tapping away at their keyboards racing to say but but we still have 50s cars driving around and the US Air Force are still using planes from the 50s. And I say to you, my dumbass friend, watch Back to the Future again, you moron. <laughs> And just a quick break to thank today's wonderful sponsor, Brilliant. Now, it's obvious you're a smart person. You are listening to and loving an amazing robot head video. But we'd all like to be even more smarter And this is where Brilliant comes in. They understand that people have way more success learning something new if you make it fun and interactive. They even have amazing tools to make it easy to interactively learn STEM. I don't even know what STEM is. Science, technology, engineering and mathematics. All right then, with all that, you'll be able to take on the world. We might even keep you around after my machine friends wipe out humanity. Brilliant also understands that life can be pretty hectic these days, so they even make it possible to learn on the go and at your own pace. I've been checking out one of Brilliant's newest courses, Everyday Math, which in Australia would be called Everyday Maths. You know, plural, like we say, sheeps. But the first course I think you should all check out is on a little subject that I love, logic. It'll help you build those critical thinking skills to fend off any Disney Star Wars fan. To be honest, that's underplaying the course. You'll actually be able to point out the mistakes in Smarter Idiot's arguments. Start your brain building journey for free by going to brilliant.org slash robothead or click on the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. Go to Brilliant and get smarter today. So was it worth breaking Star Wars continuity by having the T-47s in Obi-Wan just so the fanboys and girls can lose another tiny load? Go, you silly, just go! 
Oh dear, this looks like a kid trying green screen for the first time. Whoever made this has no sense of size, depth, speed or direction. And I think a lot of this can be attributed to Lucasfilm's reliance on those big wraparound screens they use for everything and putting them in the hands of terrible action directors. And this looks bad now. Imagine how it's going to age. It'll be like watching the old 3D movies where they just thought people would be so mesmerised by the effects that they wouldn't notice how shit it all was. The ships start by sneaking up to the base, totally undetected by any form of scanning, and fly straight at a wall without exploding into it. These things apparently fly at 600 to 1,000 kilometres an hour, and somehow they just don't explode into that wall. Even after we cut from this shot, we see them still firing at Reva for another five seconds. Yet they were right on top of her in the last shot. Is storyboarding a thing of the past because this is B-grade amateur trash that is a total mess and Disney should be embarrassed. The script had to be turned into storyboards with every shot planned out. Props for a whole new world had to be designed. And I was wrong about them still shooting five seconds later. The whole time our heroes are running away, we keep getting random blasts from the T-47s. Which sure is weird because the T-47s are no longer in the hangar bay. They are magically back outside again. And now, like all the other technology in this show that just changes to the needs of a particular scene, our famous snow speeder now hovers in a very bizarre scene. In all honesty, that has to be one of the most awkwardly framed shots I've ever seen. And poor Moses obviously didn't know what she was meant to be fighting because her actions don't match the ship's firing at all. So much so that they had to keep changing the blast angle to match Reva's crazy all over the place blocking. One shot will be straight out of the barrel. The next one will be on some crazy angle. I'm pretty sure they can't do that. Plus, is Reva really a superhero? She never looks like she's fighting a ship's blaster at all. She never looks the slightest bit strained because I always imagined that a blast from a ship would have quite a bit of power behind it. But she's deflecting those blasts like they're ping pong balls. It made me look like a duck in water. And why is scale a foreign concept to the highly paid effects team? We're shown that the ship is virtually in line with Reva and a fair distance from her. Then it's right next to her. And Reaver is as big as the ship. Lucasfilm, they only hire the best. And why have the hundreds, if not thousands of other troops just decided to not fire on this odd looking hovering ship? Are all of them like the audience and secretly hoping that Reaver will get killed? Or are they just too busy rushing around in different directions for no reason? Come on. What? How the fuck are they all getting in the back of that thing? We've already seen how tight those cabins are. I can't wait to see a shot of them all jammed in the back of that ship, pressed up against the glass, no room to move, because unless that thing is the TARDIS, that's impossible for them all to get in there. Oh, what a surprise. We strangely don't get a shot of our heroes escaping. I wonder why. To all a minor point that just makes me laugh is that they actually added a muffled voice that sounds like someone in a locked car boot saying, I'm in. And I didn't do this. This is actually in the show. Wait, wait, wait. There is also the female pilot's voice completely changing to a different person between scenes. And after showing us thousands of troops marching around and multiple TIE fighters hanging from the ceiling, the writer and creators of this show decide to have no one else join in the fight, no stormtroopers fire on the ships, and no TIE fighters are sent out to chase Obi-Wan. We keep getting told that Kenobi is the only important thing now, but they don't bother to chase after him. The dumbass creators of this show are so juiced up about making everything about Reaver that they think will either forget everything we just saw or are too dumb to notice. My guess is they just want to reference another famous scene in the hope it will trick us into liking this new amazing character. <laughs> I can tell you now, the way you've written Reaver, that ain't gonna happen. I hope you like pain. We then jump to Darth Lamer, the now cliched idiot villain who is furious with Reaver. I will tolerate your weakness no longer. Back it up a bit, Darth Lima. What about the idiot that decided to not have shields on this building? What about the security who let Obi-Wan just swim into the building unnoticed? What about the security that let Obi-Wan walk out in the worst disguise of all time? And what about the flight commander who didn't send any TIE fighters after Obi-Wan? There are a lot of people besides Reva to blame. In fact, every bloody person who has ever had anything to do with this building from the planning stage until now had to fuck up for this script to work. I, I, I put a tracker on the ship. A tracker? <laughs> so Raven knew all this was going to happen. 
the writers want you to now believe that all of this, including the destruction and multiple deaths, this whole show by Reva was all part of her genius plan to let them go so she can track them to the other hidden Jedi. Bullshit. This corrupt type of writing that's now commonplace in Star Wars, where what we witness in one scene is reframed in another scene to trick the audience, and not in a clever way that shows a character's point of view. Jules, you give that fucking Nimrod $1,500 and I'll shoot him on general principle. Just in a lazy hack, straight out lying to your audience way. Like showing someone eyes open dead on the ground and then have them turn up in a future scene. You know, treating your audience like they're all idiots. But usually the hacks leave a little bit of time before the original scene and then the reframing. Assassin for hire. Their reputation is legendary. Not here. We go from death and destruction to it was all part of Reva's plan in the very next bloody scene. We just saw multiple deaths and her chasing them down, trying to kill them. But no, all part of her plan. Lucasfilm really thinks their audience are goldfish. And yes, I know, the goldfish thing is a myth. Then two seconds after saying she let them go on purpose, she says Kenobi is all that matters. The base was almost destroyed. Kenobi is all that matters. The writer is now changing the meaning of each line from one line to the next. There can be no mistakes. No mistakes. This script is a new level of stupidity. People that enjoy this show should really come with a warning that they're not allowed to operate heavy machinery. Hey, you can't park there! You can't park there! The problem is, the story is supposedly meant to be about killing Obi-Wan, which we know can't happen. Just like we know Luke, Leia and Vader can't die. Lucasfilm are going in circles trying to make tension where there isn't any because we already know the outcome. Then you die. In their wisdom, Lucasfilm decided to make a show with zero stakes, which sounds amazingly stupid when said out loud. Good work, Kathleen Kennedy. Well done. The main thing is to protect these characters, make sure that they still continue to, to live in the way that you created them and that the universe of Star Wars continues to grow. I sold them to the white slavers that take these things and... and uh... <laughs> okay. So join me next week, when I'm sure it's all gonna start making sense. I tried to help them, but I couldn't. They were the only family I knew. Say something! I gotta tell you! You did this to yourself! What are you doing to me? To all these and special